Okay, welcome those of you who are joining live. I'll give you a moment here to sign on. And while you're joining us live, or if you're watching this in the future, I want to welcome you and begin by telling you a little bit about the Country Bookshop in Southern Pines before we get to our chat with Andrew Lawler and his book, Under Jerusalem. Uh, the Country Bookshop in downtown Southern Pines, North Carolina, is kind of unique is that we are a bookstore that is part of a small community, twice weekly award-winning newspaper called The Pilot. We are a general bookstore for kids and adults that is part of a community that chooses to shop with us and to share their stories and lives with us and celebrate the people who take a bit of history and a little bit of themselves and carve it out on the page and give us an illuminated vision like Andrew has in this book. Andrew Lawler is actually the author of three books, under Jerusalem that we'll be talking about today, the buried history of the world's most contested city, the secret token, which you joined us for in person at the bookshop, thank you, uh, the myth obsession and the search for the lost colony of Roanoke, which was a national bestseller, and did, why did the chicken cross the road? The epic saga of the bird that powers civilization. As a journalist, he has written more than a thousand newspaper and magazine articles, for more than two dozen countries. His byline has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, National Geographic, Smithsonian, and many others. He is contributing writer for science and contributing editor for archeology. span Andrew's work has appeared several times in the best of science and nature writing. So welcome. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, this is the next best thing. We, we will take care of that and make sure you get to us in person soon. But, you know, I want to open up this book. Uh, I started listening to on audio and then ha had to go to the in hand book. And I was I wanted to share with anyone watching and, and listening um, just the layout of your book, which I thought was so great. You, there's a timeline at the beginning. Um, you, you do such a great job of peppering different quotes throughout each of the three parts and at the beginning of each chapter that provides some context and uh, just the ways thinkers throughout all the times you're talking about um, have reflected on Jerusalem throughout. And then in addition to your notes, just an incredible further reading list. I mean, probably several hundred books um, in addition to an index. And I was wondering if you could walk us through this layout before we, we go deeper into the treasures that of history and people that you have in this book. Great, yes. Uh, you know, Jerusalem being a city that has been around for 5,000 years, uh, which is the center of uh, three major religions and which has had innumerable attacks and sieges and every event you can imagine. Everything that could have happened has happened in Jerusalem. So. It was a little overwhelming at first to think, how do I put this together? And the story, well, we'll talk more about the story itself, but I realized that people needed a little grounding in, in what this place is. Many people have visited Jerusalem, but even if you have, it's, it's sometimes a lot to take in that much history, that much religious history, political history, you name it. So I, I thought I'd start, uh, just do it chronologically, but I don't, do the entire 5,000 years of Jerusalem history. There have been plenty of other books that are about Jerusalem history. What I was interested in is the archeological history, how Jerusalem got to be the famous city that it is today. And that took me back to the 1860s when the first uh, permitted, first legal excavation took place by a, a very colorful French Senator named uh, de Zazi. So I start there, uh, the 1860s, and uh, really you have three separate parts of Jerusalem's history, uh, archeological history. So that made it easy to divide it into three. So the first, I really focus on those early digs from the 1860s up until about the time of World War I, uh, where mainly there are British and French and German and Russians that were busy digging in Jerusalem. And then I turn to that kind of second portion after World, War, after World War I, in which the British are controlling Jerusalem and move into uh, that all important era when for the first time, uh, Israeli archeologists and Israel's created and Israeli archeologists began to dig. And that has a natural cutoff around the year 2000 because that was the end of uh, the Oslo peace talks. There are a lot of important archeological finds that happened in the nineties. 
And then I bring it into the more modern day period, the last 20 years, and that takes up most of the third section. So, you know, they're good bite-sized pieces of history so that uh, people can really get their grounding. And I also knew uh, from my own experience that Jerusalem's a, a complicated place geographically. So I have a, a, a wonderful map artist named Jeffrey Ward who agreed to do these great maps. And I have a, an opening large map to give you a sense of where Jerusalem is. And then every chapter opens with a map of the old city that shows precisely what we're talking about, you know, where we're, where the action is happening in that chapter. And that helped me, and I believe it will really help the readers to know exactly where they are and kind of get a feel for the geography. It almost, reading it felt illuminated because it was the same map and different things popped out. I could almost see them highlighted in a way. Yeah. You know, I, um, after I heard about your book um, and we were talking about getting together to talk about it, but I had not yet read it, uh, a person who runs a book club asked me for a book recommendation to just get a grasp on what was happening in Jerusalem. Not, no, no, not one side, not the other, just a, I am missing information that I would like to have as a person walking around on this planet. And I really struggled to find a book without a particular slant. And then I realized your book is is the is the book for this book club and I recommended this and I'm before we even get into it I'm wondering if you think that was a good book club recommendation or not and why yeah as I said there are tons of books on Jerusalem so it's really hard to navigate you know what is you know it depends of course what you want to know but I re basically wrote the book that didn't exist yet I was looking for the book and couldn't find it so a little bit to my horror, I realized, oh my God, I've got, I've got to actually write the book. And that is to give people a real sense of how Jerusalem became so controversial. And it really wasn't until the 19th century that it became a controversial place. And of course, it's playing out in the headlines today. Uh, I'm sure today you could go online and find something that's happened in Jerusalem that's making the news. So my goal was as a journalist and as a reporter and author was to to not go in with my own set idea. I'm not trying to prove anything. It's really the result of my three years of exploring uh, beneath the streets as well as in the archives to find out exactly how Jerusalem got to be the city that it is today. You know, you mentioned you exploring and in the third half of the book, you really, the reader feels like we're walking around on a dig um, as, as you must have and, and the closeness of all the variations of past. And uh, I'm wondering when was the last time you were there and what was it like walking through these digs uh, having done all this research and most specifically, what was the dirt like? Well, the last time I was there was, I was very fortunate because I wrapped up my reporting in December of 2019. I came back at the end of December. And of course, you know, with COVID, everything shut down, but I was planning to spend 2020 uh, at home writing the book anyway. So I was fortunate to that extent. Most of the time that I was there in Jerusalem, I would every day go and visit a different excavation. I visited many of the excavations for several times and really got a feel for uh, the uniqueness of Jerusalem. So what's unique about this place is that unlike a lot of ancient sites, because I've written about a lot of Middle Eastern archaeological sites, most of them tend to be mounds, you know, mounds that are built up over thousands of years. So at the top, you have the new stuff. At the bottom, you have the old stuff. But Jerusalem is different because it's built on limestone. So it's built on this, uh, this very porous rock that's easy to quarry. You know, you can cut it very easily. And when you bring it above ground, it hardens and turns this beautiful golden color. But because there's no timber, there's not many trees there, people for millennia have been building with arches. So they cut the stone, they build arches, and they build these vaulted rooms. And then over time, that vaulted first floor would become a basement or become a sewer or a cistern, and then they would build on top of that. So unlike a lot of cities or most cities in the world, Jerusalem has this incredible subterranean world that goes down many levels, which was constantly being reused over the millennia. So, so say somebody's using it as a, as a cistern to hold water, 
And then they decide, no, we're gonna, we're gonna just dump our trash there, which of course for archeologists is gold because that trash can tell you so much about the way people live. So that's what makes Jerusalem so extraordinary are these, these arches that are underneath everything. And I'll tell you a story when you're ready about one of those arches I found. Tell me. Okay, so I spent a lot of time living in the old city uh, because I really wanted to, well, I didn't want to have much of a commute. And also I wanted to get a feel for what it was like to live in what is very much a medieval walled city uh, with very narrow streets. And uh, Jerusalem's intimidating, uh, I have to say, because it's hard to find your way around. It's very tense a lot of times. Uh, but I found a spot in the Christian quarter that seemed like a you know, really nice place to be. And I would go to my local grocery store. And after you know, a few weeks of that, the owner, who was a Muslim shopkeeper, he said, so who are you? Well, you're not a tourist. What, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm looking at what's underneath Jerusalem. And he laughed. And he walked from the counter to the potato chip aisle. And he lifted up a hatch. And he vanished down this hatch. What do I do? Well, OK. So I put my groceries down. And I followed him. And it was a tiny little store, but underneath was this massive, huge Crusader era hall built with these arched vaults that stretched far in the distance, far beyond the, my, my iPhone's light ability to reach the end of it. And that turned into a whole chapter in the book because it turned out that their neighbor is the Holy Sepulchre and that the monks that lived next door, these Egyptian Coptic monks had claimed this space as their own and they secretly dug it out. And meanwhile, the Muslim shopkeeper had opened the hatch one day and saw these monks down there digging in his basement. And there was a little bit of a scuffle, a little, uh, a little fight between them. And then eventually uh, they were locked in this 20 year legal battle over who owned this space. So that's just one example of one small place in my grocery store that had an amazing story. But you know, just starting where you did in the 1860s, which was, I love, and I hope everybody who reads this book, it makes so much sense that that is the place to start and that that is a, a cornerstone of, of where we find ourselves today. And what really struck me is, in addition to the in, all the people going, but just the Well, let me, the prevailing attitudes of where heritage lies at, at that moment, where, you know, you, you talk about Twain and Warren and, and DeSoto's coming in and looking to find the heritage that exists outside ourselves and dig around and claim it versus uh, the people who lived there who, who, understood living in an evolving arc of time and the heritage is just within ourselves, not outside of ourselves. And you highlighted that just at the beginning as, and it seemed to me to be just the, the cornerstone of, of where we find ourselves today. Did I read that right? Can you talk to that a little bit? Just, you know, the shopkeeper opening up and finding the monks and, and why are you there? Yes. Um when this was the big surprise for me when I was kind of delving into Jerusalem's past, that in the eight, 19th century, before that, most Westerners didn't go there. It wasn't a place you wanted to go. It wasn't very popular. But there was this push in the mid 1800s to try and use science to prove the Bible. This is really about Protestants, Western Protestants, both American as well as European, going to Jerusalem to try and dig up the biblical past, because it's a time when Darwin is doing his work in evolution, geologists are calling into question Genesis, and uh, there were those who decided we can use this new science of archaeology to prove that what the Bible says is true. Now, that's part of it. Also, there was a lot of interest in finding treasure and finding things that you could bring back to your national museum. In this case, the Louvre, uh, where this first archaeologist found this sarcophagus with the remains of a, of, a, of a royal queen, he takes it back to the Louvre, where it becomes a sensation. It was the first time people could go to a museum and see the remains of what was purported to be from biblical times. Now, it turned out that uh, he was wrong, that this queen actually lived uh, a little bit after the time of Jesus and wasn't part of 
the Old Testament at all, but it got people excited. And it also infuriated people, mainly the Jewish community in Jerusalem, which said, what are you doing? This, these are our, our ancestors. You're digging up our ancestors. You're desecrating our graves. So from the beginning, there was this tension between the Westerners who wanted to come and dig up the remains of the Bible and the people who lived there who focused on the shrines that were there and they weren't interested in digging because they thought that that was just a, a terrible thing to do. Even from the, the first Frenchman there, and, and you start, you say it was the first legal dig, you know, they start, it's been 500 years since the Crusaders and um, there were contracts and permissions, but no, people were not paying attention to them. And it spoke to me and you did not go deep into the personalities of these explorers coming to dig for you know, what we know is treasure, but for science and discovery and things as well. Uh, can you talk about those initial interactions between the archeologists seeking science and the politicians and who was controlling what and how um, the politicians were adhered to and consequences or lack thereof? Yeah, at the time in the 19th century, Jerusalem was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, these were Turkish speaking people based in Istanbul. And so they controlled the whole, what we would call the Holy Land, including Jerusalem. And, and the other piece is that at that same time, the Ottoman Empire was having trouble. It was beginning to fray at the edges. And these European powers, this is the time when European countries are expanding their empires in Africa and Asia. And the Ottoman Empire was kind of the the ultimate prize in this 19th century race to control large swaths of land. And Jerusalem was the perfect place for these Westerners to go because it was a Christian place. It was sacred to Christians. So they kind of had a, a reason to go there. Oh, we're going there to, uh, you know, to, to, to pay homage to a place that's important for Christianity. But their, their ultimate goal was to control Jerusalem and to control the entire Ottoman Empire. So from the beginning, this interest in, in archaeology was also political. From the beginning, the idea was if we can control what's below, then we probably can have an impact on what's above. So that was a, a big impetus for these explorers to come. And now I should also say these weren't really archaeologists because archaeology is a very new science. And it wasn't until you know around the late 1890s or 1900s that what we can call a science really came into being. So really these people who came from France and Germany and the United States, they were explorers. They were military officers. They were uh, missionaries. They were monks and priests. They were people who, who weren't archeologists per se, but they were interested in pursuing the past while also keeping an eye on the politics of the present. The narrative, you know, I there's a certain, I'm um, fast forward, still in part one, but fast forwarding a little bit. Um, but it's, when it all seemed to come to head for me was around the, the ark and then how the Jewish population was, was rising, the, that, and I'm paraphrasing here, but setting you up and, and that all of a sudden the Jewish people had gotten um, the Western, they were getting blamed for what the Western archeologists were doing as well. And it, it was this huge blow up with protests and national newspapers and everything happening. And that to me seemed like the first flare in the air um, to the modern conflict. Can you bring us back to that and give us background and set the scene and then show how that propelled us forward? Sure. I mean, you have these Western explorers then who are, who are busy digging underground, digging in Jerusalem. And what are they looking for? Well, yes, they're looking for, uh, for old walls and old houses and pottery and trying to piece together the history. But they're also looking for treasure. They're also looking for the temple treasures in particular. So when uh, Solomon's temple, uh, the Bible mentions it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., so six centuries before, before Jesus, you had this massive invasion, this destruction. And the temple treasures were mentioned in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible as these you know, incredible array of gold and silver vessels. 
and of course the Ark of the Covenant was the ultimate artifact, the ultimate sacred object, which, which according to the scripture sat in the middle of the temple. But at some point it vanishes. We don't know what happened to it. And it really was not that big of a mystery in ancient times, but in the 19th century, it suddenly became a really hot topic. So this is where Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark really comes from. Uh, it was in the late 1890s when people started to get interested in looking for these temple treasures. And there was this one expedition that is so crazy, you just can't make it up. A British aristocrat named Montague Brownlow Parker hooks up with this uh, Finnish poet and uh, biblical scholar who thinks that he has cracked a code in the Bible that it says exactly where the temple treasures, including the ark, can be found. So they put together a team, they got money from Americans and Europeans, uh, both Jewish and Christian, and they went to, the, uh, went to Jerusalem to dig. Now, this is all secret. They pretended like they were doing, oh, we're just gonna be digging, we're gonna build a hospital. I mean, there are all kinds of ways they try to hide what they were doing, but Jerusalem's a small town and pretty quickly, everybody knew that they were after the ultimate treasure, a treasure that, was estimated to be worth in today's dollars, several billion dollars. So this isn't just about science, it's not just about religion, it's also about finding valuable treasure. And when they dug and dug and didn't find anything, the British aristocrat got nervous. He got afraid that he was gonna owe a lot of people a lot of money. So he bribed the guard at the noble sanctuary or the Temple Mount, which was a Muslim holy site, still is. And in the middle of the night, he went with a group of his men and they went into the Dome of the Rock, which is that, that golden domed building that you see on the cover of the book. And they went inside at night and they began to hammer away at the sacred rock at the center of this shrine. Sacred to Jews who believed that this was at the center of where the Jewish temple had been and sacred to Muslims who believed that that was the spot that Muhammad had gone up to heaven on a mystical journey. So this was really dangerous business for a Christian to be you know, wailing away at this rock uh, was, was, not, uh, was not very smart because of course people heard, they came running, the Englishmen had to get out of town quick and they got on their yacht in the harbor in Jaffa and sailed away. But the implications of this were huge. They didn't find Solomon's treasures, of course, but what they did was they made the local Muslims furious at the Ottomans who had allowed this to happen. You know, these Ottoman rulers in, in Istanbul had given the approval for this. So this was really the beginning of Palestinian nationalism, that, hey, we Arab Muslims have to take control and we have to uh, protect our holy site because the Ottomans won't. And certainly the English are just after treasure. So this was the beginning of something that, of course, echoed, as you're alluding to, into the future and affects us today in the 21st century. And it made so much sense. It made, it, I mean, not in a logical way, but in a, oh, okay, here's, this is the first flare. I, th through this lens that makes sense of what I know about all the pieces fit together here. And then you're, and this is just, what, a third of the way through the book. I believe, as 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 you because can then, because then that it's the, then this expedition really upset a lot of Jews both in in Jerusalem as well as in Europe and America, and so Baron Rothschild, who was a, a wealthy uh, French banker, he pulled together the money and created his own expedition because his view was, hey, why should we let these Christians go to Jerusalem and dig up? our stuff, our cultural heritage. So there was this, this secret race that went on between a Jewish group and a Christian group to try and find Solomon's treasures. And the Muslims, meanwhile, are saying, who are these crazy people? They're like lifting the potato thing and being like, get out. Yeah, like what are they, what are they doing here? Uh, and plus the, the, the British did not endear themselves to the local population when Charles Warren, who was a, a British army officer who was a really key explorer, fascinating guy, he was a Mason, he was really interested in, uh, in kind of esoteric uh, masonry, 
And he was using gunpowder to blast his way underground and shaking his people's homes above. And so from the beginning, particularly the Muslim population of Jerusalem was not really well disposed to these foreigners showing up and uh, setting off gunpowder charges beneath their homes and close to their very important sacred site. And now, wasn't it a, a very well-connected um, Arab family who were finally able to legally get some of these explorers kicked out? Or is it well, rewind well, a little bit? Yes. Uh, Charles Warren, who I mentioned, you know, he was the one using this gunpowder, and he really irritated uh, the, the Muslim leaders in Jerusalem, the Arab Muslim leaders. And so one family in particular, they sued. They sent a de depositions to London saying our homes have been damaged, we're outraged by what's going on, we expect to be compensated for the damage. And in the end, the Palestine Exploration Fund, which was the organization that had hired Charles Warren and others to go and dig, uh, they simply ignored it. They simply said, too bad. And the British government really didn't have enough control to say, hey, we, you know, you should make right by these people. So from the start, you had this tension between the locals, particularly the, the Muslim Arabs, as well as the, you know, uh, against these uh, foreign archaeologists. So that really set things up for the 20th century and into the 21st. Uh, I, I'm going to, well, in the epilogue, you quote the late Ronnie Ellenbaum, and you talk, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, that the fighting is over the narrative. And, and we talked at the beginning about how the last part of the book, you walking through these sites that are happening now, the narrative is still being uncovered um, today with modern archeologists. Can you talk about who the modern, who are the people digging right now and what are what is their thinking and contrast that to to Warren and these and these people before whether that's technology, political space, funding, um, or or where they see themselves in the narrative. What I discovered was was that to my surprise, 150 years after that first French dig in the 1860s. Uh, the country, the names of the countries have changed, the people in charge have changed, the science has changed. I mean, the world has changed tremendously. And yet, what goes on in Jerusalem is remarkably similar today to what it was 150 years ago. So that's what my surprise was, that, that Israeli archaeologists simply are following, they're doing, and with better science, they're doing what the Europeans were doing 150 years ago. Uh, now their motives have changed a little bit because the Western Europeans and Americans, they were interested, these mainly Protestants, they were interested in proving the Bible, finding biblical remains. That was their focus. And everything changed in 1967 when during the Six Day War, Israel was able to conquer East Jerusalem, which included the old city. So the really old part of Jerusalem with all the shrines, including the Dome of the Rock, that came under Israeli control. So for the first time, Israeli archeologists had a chance to dig. Well, and as you led into that, when you first, I had no idea where you're going with the story because you talk about these six chairs, six chairs got brought into a courtyard and it took me back to all these disputes we've been going through. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, this is the beginning of the, of the six days war. And it, and it, I, this is what I love so much about this book and why I think it'll be the great Christmas book and why it'll, it's the honestly the great book club book um, to open this up because it is not as small, but just, you know, a treasure hunter using dynamite under your house leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. Um, please continue. I just. Yeah. So, uh, so you had Warren digging in the 1860s using his his uh, gunpowder, dynamite had been created, but he didn't quite, it hadn't been patented yet. So uh, he had to use old fashioned gunpowder, but you had, you had somebody digging, the people upstairs not liking it. So what's happening today? Well, I talk one chapter about this incredible tunnel that's being built uh, as we speak 
beneath the old city of David. It's in, now it's an Arab neighborhood, but it's a little rocky spine of land that comes south of the Acropolis, the Temple Mount or Noble Sanctuary, depending on, on uh, how you phrase it. And what happened was they discovered the remains of an, of an ancient Roman street that led all the way up this very steep rocky hill up to the city's Acropolis, then called the Temple Mount 2000 years ago. And uh, the Israeli Antiquities Authority, along with the uh, City of David Foundation, which is a, a right-wing Jewish group, they pulled together the funding to create basically a subway tunnel underneath this largely Arab neighborhood that exposes this amazing street. So archaeologically, it's a you know, fascinating find that brings to light a, a stairwell that was probably used by Jesus and others in the first century. Uh, and yet it is also, as happened with Warren, created a lot of tension because people above are saying, you know, you're, this heavy equipment is destroying our foundations, it's destroying our homes. And uh, as it was 150 years ago, it's a really big debate, debate that is quite contentious, that is wrapped up in the politics, because of course the Europeans were looking for biblical remains uh, and didn't really have much interest in the Arabs that lived above, um, or the Jews that lived above for that matter. And today it's really quite similar that the Israeli Antiquities Authority, the great archeologists are doing this work, but it's having these implications above, which is leading in some cases to violence and certainly to increase tension uh, with the, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Well, even in the book, that one point in the street, it, you mentioned you're like, it's not what they wanted to find digging, digging around. It's, you know, you have these people funding going down there with these agendas and, and at times what they're finding is not the narrative that politically they, they would prefer to, to, to stand yeah. on. And yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the funny thing is that you find that the science, that archaeology can come up with surprises which don't necessarily fit into your narrative, whether you're, you have a Christian story or a Muslim story or a Jewish story. Uh, science doesn't care. And you know, good archaeology produces these kinds of surprises. So in the case of that street, for example, the assumption had always been, well, this was something that Herod the Great built or one of his successors built uh, to glorify the Jewish temple up on the Temple Mount. You, know, you have a monumental avenue leading up to it. And that was assumed, well, it must be the case. But when the archaeologists, and these are Israeli Jewish archaeologists, when they found the coins that gave them precise dating of this street, they were shocked to discover that it wasn't built until the 30s or the 40s of the, the first uh, century. And who was in charge of Jerusalem then? Well, it, there was not a Jewish ruler. There was a Roman by the name of Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate, of course, is is despised by many Christians as the person who allowed Jesus to be crucified or who ordered it. Uh, and for the Jews, he was seen as, a, as, you know, as this terrible, uh, you know, terrible autocrat who paid no homage and was disrespectful toward Judaism. And yet the science shows that here's this despised Roman ruler who was clearly responsible in many ways for building this monumental path which led up to the Jewish temple. So it kind of turns on our heads some of the narratives, some of the ideas that we have about figures that we've heard about since our childhood. And, you know, it, the, at the core of this book is this is the love for archaeology. And, and what, you know, it brings somebody seemingly so far away, so close to us today. And I really appreciated um, your conversations and, and your conclusions talking about the modern archeologists and how they navigate um, these digs in, in this moment. And I know you spoke with so, I mean, you were on these digs. You, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that experience, um, either you know, what you have in the book or just tell us a story and, and take us there. Um, and I am very curious what the dirt looks like, feels like, smells like, um, just if you will. Well, there, there, there is dirt. You know, what? one of the interesting things about, about this subterranean world is that because it's limestone, as I mentioned, 
it's very crumbly. Mm -hmm. And you add that to the fact that people have been digging, making quarries, making basements, and that buildings have been destroyed over time or renovated. And so you have all of this debris, these like little chips of stone uh, and mixed in with dust. And it looks like it's stable and solid, but this is one of the really hard and dangerous things about Jerusalem archeology span is that, for example, this tunnel they're building, uh, I was there a couple of times when they had some collapses where a hole opened up in a parking lot of a mosque above. And I just happened to be going by that afternoon and there had been big rains uh, the previous couple of days. And as I went by, I saw this giant cement truck that was there in the parking lot. And I went over, it's just kind of curious. And so the guy got out and he was a contractor for the city of Jerusalem. And there was, there was a big pothole, you know, a giant hole that had opened up during the rains, it happens. And he pointed the, the slide down to this hole and then let loose. So that all this cement is going into the hole. Then meanwhile, I see a guy run up from the, the, the tunnel that's being built underneath. And he's like, stop, stop. And the guy's like, what? And it, when I went down below, I saw that this, this concrete was going into the hole and then coming right into the tunnel below. So they're filling up the very tunnel they're trying to dig. And that's because the ground is so uh, unsteady that holes can open up. In fact, Charles Warren described the soil underneath Jerusalem as, as looking like it's solid, but it can turn to liquid in an instant. And that is very dangerous because of course, if you're underneath and that collapses, then uh, you might be injured. And fortunately, nobody's been injured in this project, but they've had some very close calls. Uh, for those of you who are joining us live, if you would like to enter a question um, there is both a chat and a Q&A um, section. I will mon monitor them both. Uh, as, as Andrew and I continue to chat, I'd love for you to ask any questions that, that you have. And I will rearrange here. Um, so what has, we were talking about this a little bit before we uh, opened it up, but what has the reception been like? The book came out Tuesday, last Tuesday. That's right. Mm -hmm. What been out a week? Been out a week, so a one week old book baby. So, so what's the what's the reception been like as it's making its way into the world? Jerusalem is, uh, as you mentioned, in a couple of times in the book, um, on either side of it, not not a, a topic a lot of people are passionate about. So, yeah, yeah, and and this is as uh, Simon Montefiore, who wrote he wrote a biography of Jerusalem. As he said, and I think I quote him in the book, like in Jerusalem, when it comes to Jerusalem, every word counts. So I, I strove to be very careful with my facts. I have footnotes in the back that you referenced uh, that took me a long time to do, but I really wanted to be sure that I was as accurate as possible. And that's because uh, if you make mistakes, uh, people, when it comes to Jerusalem, people will hold you accountable and right because it is such a contested place that you know, you want to get your facts right. So I did my best to do that, and partly through footnotes, and partly through having other people who are knowledgeable about Jerusalem read it and give me comments. And that really, uh, I think, made a difference because to my great relief, uh, I've had a series of reviews that have come out in the past couple of weeks that the one word that has been used in at least three or four reviews is even-handed. And they can criticize my writing. They can say that my ideas are terrible. You know, that wouldn't bother me as much as if they said it wasn't even handed. So the fact that, that different uh, reviewers are, are you know, really coming to the conclusion that, that I'm really not coming to this story with my own narrative I'm trying to prove, that I really am exploring, and this is what I found, uh, trying to put that out as honestly and as accurately as possible. So that's that's been uh, a great relief to know that it's being received that way. Well, the archaeology, as the Roman Street people found, does not lie. You know, the you've written along this topic uh, in National Geographic about this. And I'm curious, was this a magazine article first, or was that just a part of something you did as you were working on the book? Or when did you know, I mean, I cannot imagine, 
I am, this is part of why I wanted to do the layout at the beginning because the organization and the choices that you've made in this book are really beautiful in terms of taking a giant narrative and compacting it. Um, so I'm just curious how that structure came to you throughout this research. Well, thank you. Um, well, the, I, let me, why don't I talk about the genesis of the book? So I've written a lot about Middle Eastern archeology span over you know, the past 20 years gone to lots of countries there, written about a lot of places. I always, although I visited Jerusalem many times, I always steered clear of it a little bit because, because of the politics, because of the religion, because it was so contested, it just seemed like uh, it would be too difficult and too hard. And then uh, a few years ago, I was at a conference in Israel and uh, a friend who's an archeologist said, hey, uh, you know, well, let's go to Jerusalem and I'll take you on a little tour, we'll have lunch. So we went, what I thought was gonna be a nice long lunch and a short walk. Well, it turned out that six hours later, I was still underground. He took me underground to these sites, introduced me to the archeologist and I was blown away. I thought I knew what was under there and I had no idea. And I had that, a particular sinking feeling of, oh no, this is a book. Uh, because I realized that this combination of politics and religion and science all together in one small place. Remember, the old city is not much bigger than the, the reservoir in Central Park. It's a very small space. And for you to have that kind of density of intensity was uh, astonishing to me. And I realized maybe I am become more foolish in my old age that, that this is a story that needed writing. So that's when I dove into it. And then while visiting these sites, the archeologists would say, oh, oh, see over there, that's Warren's tunnel. Oh, that's where Charles Wilson dug. That They were talking about all these people I never heard of who lived in the 19th century. And that what they dug is still there. So then I could go to the archives and start to find out who were these people? How does this all fit together? And then I could see this, this clear storyline from the beginning of the first dig all the way up to this, this tunnel that's being built. Uh, today. So there was such a clear connection. And as I said, no other book that had tried to tackle that topic. So we have a question from the audience. Um, what, what are the hottest questions Jerusalem archaeologists are trying to answer today? Great question. Uh, well, I'd say there are lots of them. Uh, let me give you one example. The city of David. Now we've all heard of King David and King Solomon. And the story in the Bible is that the Israelites arrived in Jerusalem, they conquer it from the local Canaanites or Jebusites as they were called, and that became the capital of Judea. And that for the next generation, during the time of Solomon, David's son, uh, there was this empire in that area and Solomon built palaces, the queen of Sheba came to visit. It was a really grand place. But strangely, the archeology span showed none of this. In fact, there still is no solid uh, evidence that is not argued about over by archaeologists that this place even existed during those first couple of centuries, like around 1000 BC to, to say 800 BC. And so that's been a big mystery. It's like, where is this important missing piece of Jerusalem history? Now, about 15 years ago, an, an archaeologist named Elat Mazar found what she called the Palace of David. She believed she had found the place where David had built a palace. But other archeologists say, no, 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 no. Your dating is wrong. The evidence is not good enough. And most archeologists have not accepted that. So I'd say one of the big burning questions is where is the famous city of Solomon? We still don't know. If anyone else has any questions, please feel to type, type them in. Um, you know, the people, the archaeologist people, uh, you highlight so many in the book and the, the, this concept of their work, the tunnels still being there, just physically present, you know, 150 years later underground, um, made me think of one of the archaeologists I'm more curious about is Kennan. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit for our, our audience. Um, sure. Uh, you know, she was one of the great archaeologists of the 20th century. And only now are people really beginning to, to see that. So Kathleen Kenyon was, uh, was British. I believe her father was the head of the British Museum and she grew up in a castle in, in England. 
became interested in history and spent lots of time digging in the Middle East. She's most famous for her dig at Jericho. So she was a very devout Protestant while also being a great archeologist. And when she dug Jericho, she was looking for those walls that collapsed when you know, they marched around Jericho, uh, what's it, seven times and blowing horns and the walls collapsed. And despite her attempts, she couldn't find evidence of that. So she decided that this was a story that, that wasn't literally true. And shortly after that, she went to Jerusalem to see what she could find. She was digging at the city of David, the place I was talking about. She was eager to find this place that archeologists had been unable to really nail down. When we knew that, that the Judean city was in this little bit of land, but we couldn't find those, those first couple of centuries. And despite her digging, she couldn't find it either, but she did find some really important uh, earlier uh, structures from the Middle Bronze Age, which showed that Jerusalem was quite a substantial city uh, by the time the Israelites arrived. Uh, but she left in 1967, shortly after the war, because uh, it was under Jordanian control and the Israelis came in, she decided to leave. And that's the part, that's the time when Israeli archeologists uh, began to do the digging they've been doing ever since. Well, I, um, I, I cannot tell you what a pleasure this book was for me to engage with. Uh, and, and I did not come to it expecting to enjoy it so much. I came to it <laughs> expecting to, to like learn some stuff, you know, get some context, you know, dive into like the little girl archaeologist in me. But it was, it was just, it was a pleasure to read it. It, it, was page turning and, and informative and gave me context. And then I really enjoyed, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, as we were talking about the layout, the quotes that you peppered throughout. And so all, all of a sudden you pop the reader out of the book and really give some context as to what writers and other thinkers are, um, how they are thinking about Palestine at, at that time. And I'm wondering, how you came to those as you were you, you talked about the genesis of the book but it's seen your research has been not only boots on the ground but all encompassing and I'm wondering about those other snippets that you plop in that meant so much to me um, and made it such a and it aided in my pleasure of, of reading it but I'm wondering how those appeared to you well that's that's great to know because that was my goal uh, you know, Jerusalem is important archaeologically, but while I write about archaeology, I'm also interested in, in other things. Uh, you know, the city obviously has created an incredibly uh, complicated politics. It's been the center of religious innovation for thousands of years. I mean, that's what makes Jerusalem important, ultimately. I mean, it's a, it was a small town in a pretty rugged, not very important place for a long time, and yet it's become one of the most famous cities in the world. So, it, as a result, it has inspired not only people who are religious, uh, but poets as well. It has inspired so many people to write about it. And William Blake, for example, the great uh, British poet uh, who was a mystic. So you get this mix of religion as well as uh, mystical views of the city. And I thought that was important to, to give a flavor for why people are so drawn to this place. It's not just proving the Bible or finding treasure. It's also a place that that inspires people and gives them a sense of, of hope. You know, it's a, it's a place where, uh, where God is thought to reside in a special way, whatever religion you're talking about, uh, the three major faiths. And, and that I think is a really important piece that I didn't wanna get lost in describing details of archeology. span that's, that's important and that's in the book, but I really wanted to give people a, a flavor and a taste of, of how Jerusalem below and above has inspired people. Well, I, I think I am going to end on that because this has been a treat and thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us at the Country Bookshop. I will link, uh, you can buy a copy of this book at the Country Bookshop. It's also available in audio on Libro FM. But as I mentioned, the, the way, the fit, having the physical object of the book really aids in the pleasure of reading with the maps and, and the references and being able to go back to the notes and um, 
So I strongly encourage you to buy uh, Under Jerusalem from the Country Bookshop. And um, thank you, Andrew, for chatting. And I'll look, you've got to come visit. I would love to. And let me just put a plug in for the Country Bookshop because you know, I've been traveling around on a book tour and I've seen how independent bookstores have managed to weather what is perhaps the biggest crisis in the past hundred years uh, for bookstores. And it's great to see the communities are showing up, people are showing up, they wanna support these institutions because without people going to the bookstore and looking at a book and buying the book, uh, they will go away. So I just say congratulations on having weathered this storm and I hope you prosper. Thank you. And that's to all our community. So thank, thank you guys for, for showing up for us. So I'll see you soon.